Has anybody in the room assessed cavitation as potential failure mode for projects? Okay. We do as well. Um, hey, have you ever had it make it to action? Okay. Just curiosity. And I, I know it's an issue we shouldn't overlook, but um, we we just we haven't had risk driving failure modes in our portfolio that I'm aware of being cavitation driven. I did not see, I didn't see a yes. Is, are there any yeses to risk driving failure modes associated with cavitation? All right, I don't want to minimize that. I shouldn't have started off with that, but let's get into it. All right, so learning objectives, talk a little about uh, the really interesting mechanism of cavitation, what it is and how it forms, and then ultimately how to estimate it. And then some event trees that are gonna look exactly like the event trees we've had for all these spillway erosion, or spillway failure modes. All right, so some of the basics, you know, cavitation is basically boiling of water due to, to pressure drop, not temperature. Um, so when cavitation occurs, it's, it's generally in individual bubbles or combinations of bubbles that, that form vapor pockets. And those vapor pockets, when they collapse um, in the flow field, they're not an issue. When they collapse in the free surface, they're not an issue. But when they collapse on engineered materials or materials we don't want to get destroyed they're an issue because when they get near the you know as the pressure increases when they get near the boundary when they collapse they develop a shock wave that can be it's basically a little jackhammer that can eat through stainless steel given enough time and severe enough pressure drop all right just some basic definitions so cavitation index it it's not as important as the fruit number, but there's a, a, a dimensionless number called the Euler, Euler number, Euler number. Anyway, that, that's really the re relationship of a pressure um, and inertia, and that's, that's what we have with the cavitation index, just modified a bit, but it's basically that dimensionless parameter. And the lower the number, the more severe the cavitation. So we start off, um, we don't have anything with that dimensionless number that we'll talk about in a bit above three. Um, really, once we get below one, we start having potential to have cavitation that means something for structural elements like concrete. And then when we get down below 0.3 is when we historically have really start to see damage to concrete. And just terminology, super cavitation is when we get in that range below 0.3. Has anybody heard the super cavitating baffle block? It's kind of the new thing in baffle blocks. So the, the thought of that is you're going to get super cavitation because you have this big blunt object in the flow field, but you're going to taper the, the concrete surfaces back so it doesn't collapse. So you have super cavitation, but the cavitation doesn't collapse on the concrete surface. And you have ramps because we also get vortex instead of the, the vortex is you know basically a big swarm of these cavitation bubbles and it has to collapse either on a on a surface in the water body or the free surface so the ramp kicks the vortex so it collapses into um, the free surface and not in the concrete all right Folsom dam was really the big federal project that drove a lot of research on that baffle block all right cavitation damage always occurs downstream of whatever asperity and flow now that unlike slab jacking it could be offsets down not only offsets up but an asperity in flow that creates that significant pressure drop is is really the culprit for hydraulic structures and this just shows some examples of what those asperities could be and and where you would want to look for damage if you're trying to find cavitation um, I just want to point out it's, it is a time-dependent process and one of the more helpful diagrams from USBR in this case it's EM42 um, cavitation and hydraulic structures, I think, is a diagram of case histories of the flow conditions versus the time it took to get to minor major damage. So that's really helpful. It is time dependent. A lot of our knowledge of how it affects um, structures is really empirical. All right, so detection. The big difference um, in cavitation, so cavitation can be easily, I guess, misdiagnosed um, because we have abrasion on a lot of our hydraulic structures and they can look kind of similar but abrasion is smooth and cavitation is 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 rough it's you know it's all these jackhammers basically attacking the structure if it's concrete or if it's steel um, so it's pretty rough and this is just showing a valve where you can see that that's pretty serrated 
this is Bluestone Dam where we're actually constructing super cavitating baffle blocks now, but you can see on these deflector blocks that um, there's cavitation at two locations. I'm not exactly sure why there's this location, but it's it's where you have the most significant pressure drop and then reattachment. And it's completely symmetrical. So this project has 16 sluices. They all have this exact same design and they operate um, pretty frequently and they have for more than 75 years. And every single deflector block has this cavitation damage in the exact same location. And you can see that it's it's wet and green gauge steel there. So it's not it's not trivial. It's it's a lot of damage. Um, so this is that concept of this is abrasion. You know, some tool bed material or you know some some durable stone material or, or something else, maybe steel that that does work over time. On um, you know on the concrete in this case, it's smooth. Cavitation damage in a similar situation is is really angular. It's it's not grinding. It, it it's exploding. I guess. All right. So case histories. This is not talked about as much, um, but Hoover Dam was actually experienced some pretty significant cavitation damage after construction. And it was in this case it was due. So both Hoover Dam and Glen Canyon, which I'm going to talk about next, are USBR dams on the Colorado River. And they both used the original diversion tunnels um, as part of the emergency spillway. So the the river diversion um, tunnels are relatively flat and then the spillways were constructed after the fact and tied into those. So they have these high velocity zones and then elbows. So this was a misalignment of one of those joints at the transition between the steep section of the spillway and the tunnel section. Um, so many years, many decades later, Glen Canyon Dam um, was constructed pretty similar with this geometry of where the emergency spillway utilized the river diversion tunnels. Um, this project set empty for, or not empty, but wasn't full for more than 20 years. And in 1983, there was a, a really large snowpack in Colorado River, um, really long duration, high magnitude flood that forced the operation of the Glen Canyon spillway. And um, upon operation, they noticed that there was a lot of vibration, noise, and there were actual concrete chunks flying out of the, the flip bucket at the end of the spillway, or the flip lip. And they were able to manage, there's two tunnels left and right, and they were able to manage back and forth to do inspections and see what was going on. And they, they found that there was this Christmas tree shape to where you know, cavitation invites more cavitation, right? So um, you have this offset. In this case, it was calcite that created a really low cavitation index. Cavitation occurred, collapsed on the relatively thin liner downstream, destroyed it, and created more offsets for cavitation so it just kind of progressed downstream and there was pretty erodible materials underneath this um, so ultimately it progressed to something that's pretty dramatic um, and there's a really good book the emerald mile that that has a whole chapter dedicated to this incident it's, it's a greater broad level view of the colorado river and, and dams and whatnot but it's got a really good chapter with the author of em 41 and 42 hank falvey has got interviews and talks about this mechanism and how they were estimating it and you know doing all this stuff real time trying to manage this flood. Long story short, um, at the location there was some pretty low cavitation index. All right, this is Libby Dam. This is a USACE dam on the um, a tributary to the Columbia. It was built in the 60s, I guess completed in the 70s. Um, and upon completion there was some pretty severe damage um, downstream of the of the sluiceways and USBRs witnessed this, and this is actually in your dams. I'm, I imagine that some of you have probably seen cavitation damage downstream of sluiceways, to where you have small openings, so you got high velocity if you have high head behind it. Um, so you have a high velocity that's coming through a, a small area into a shallow flow depth, so the pressure is inherently low there. So you have high velocity, low pressure. If you go back to the cavitation index, that's bad. Um, another thing that this geometry does is breaks up the boundary layer. So the turbulent boundary layer is going to minimize the, you know, the, the near bed velocity that's going to create that pressure drop. So that gets busted up as it goes through this gate. So it can make things a lot worse on the invert. And typically that's one of the reasons we have extended steel liners downstream from sluiceways for high head dams. 
All right, event tree looks like everything else. So I'm not going to spend too much time, but essentially you have a flow condition that, that creates these low cavitation index with a material that's subject to cavitation damage. So it initiates, um, in most cases, it initiates without inspection and intervention um, through a robust operation and maintenance plan. Um, in the case of Glen Canyon and um, Hoover Dam, the it happened relatively uh, quickly, and those projects were subject to long duration of flows with thin slabs, so it ate through and then eroded the underlying materials, fell slabs, and then we're back into the same erosion of spillways and erosion of rock and soil. All right, so key considerations, cavitation index, low is bad, below 0.3 deserves a lot of attention. Um, it's an index, so it's not a, phys you know, it's not a physics physical parameter as at least in the way we relate it to how it affects damage so big bluff bodies like baffles can have cavitation damage at, at cavitation index around one to where it's small offsets it's probably going to be below that point three to where you get into issues aeration of flow changes the sonic velocity of water so when those those bubbles collapse it's cushioned by the fact that the air's you know the water it's an air water mixture so just the dissolved air, I guess, in the water. Maybe it's not dissolved, but the, the air bubbles that are already present in the water cushion that collapse. It doesn't take much, something like 5%. It's pretty significant. So if it's aerated flow at the invert, then um, it's pretty good mitigation for cavitation. And that's actually how we modify our structures generally to minimize cavitation damage. Um, the ability to, uh, to inspect and, and maintain is pretty big on this failure mode. Um, if the structure is operated under similar conditions for, for years or decades and you don't see cavitation damage, well, that's probably a pretty good indication that cavitation damage is not, not a concern. Um, that's why we inspect the condition of the liner. Um, as with all these spillway failure modes, the rotability of the foundation materials is, is a huge consideration. Because the next question, if we eat through whatever liner it is that that we have that's subject to damage, is what happens next? And that's typically a, a geologic factor in the foundation. Duration, frequency of flows. This is very time dependent, and our ability to shut off and and decrease. So is it gated? All right, great resources. Um, this is Hank Falvey's. Um, monograph on cavitations and shoots and spillways excellent reference talks about the mechanics and ways to estimate um, we we do some treatment in our hydraulic um, design of spillways so here's the definition of the cavitation index so we have some reference pressure and it's the index of the flow so we have some reference pressure we have some vapor pressure which depends on temperature and elevation and in the case of usbr they define it as um, basically a function of the velocity head, um, but we're using pressure and not the hydraulic feet of water, right? So the way you say treats it and other, it can be treated, is you just make this the reference head, so it's pressure in feet of water. This is the velocity head over, um, this is the vapor, I'm sorry, this is the vapor, um, the equivalent head resulting from the vapor pressure, so negative, you know, whatever it is, 29 to, 32 depending on where you're at and this is just the velocity head so don't get confused if you see it written different ways it works out to the exact same number all right and this index can be used um used to see if it's a you know especially on things that don't have observation don't have uh you know performance history to evaluate the potential and again below three is really bad two to five can be a concern um larger abrupt offsets in the flow are generally going to create cavitation so um, it's our you know job to then assess is that cavitation occurring going to be an issue as far as cavitation damage um, there's many diagrams like this I think this one's from the core because you see we're using feet of water um, but just to estimate are we going to have cavitation or no cavitation that doesn't mean cavitation damage just that we're going to have ca cavitation occurring this is, there's very limited work on this, but there, there is some relative difference for, for materials as far as their ability to, to erode due to cavitation damage. I think ASC has a good manual out on this. We probably should update with that, but um, just, just to give some reference, if we, we hinge everything on this 30 meters per second to some depth, and we say concrete's the baseline. This is just saying that if 
if we wanted to see an equivalent, um, say stainless steel, and we draw this line way out, you can make the reference that twice that 60 meters per second, um, the concrete is 10,000 times more erodible than stainless steel. Just a relative measure, just to give some idea. This is the helpful one for a risk assessment in my mind. So this is the cavitation index of the flow, and we're assuming some, some chamfer and offset and that, that's driving this pressure drop. And then we look at operation, duration of operation in days, weeks, months, and then we've got the case histories that, that had minor and major damage. Uh, there's not great definitions of what those mean, but it gives you some relative context of, um, of how long we would have to see these low cavitation index numbers with our given materials to, to start to, to get into issues. All right, air is the, the primary defense measure, measure, and that's because it drops the sonic velocity of the water, cushions it, and we typically do that at the upper end of chutes with air ramps. So we want the air at the invert. We don't want it generally, um, it, it may take too long when we'll have upper chute cavitation damage if we rely on self aeration. All right, time dependent. Um, you guys have probably ran across uh, some references that relate to some threshold velocity, you know, 40 feet per second or X number, 60 feet per second. Um, that probably gives a relative screening, um, but the cavitation index is pretty easy to compute and it's, it's a better indicator of cavitation damage potential. So generally recommend going with that. Um, you know, Glen Canyon and Hoover are, are really large dams that, that, sub, that were subject to pretty severe cavitation damage or minimal cavitation damage because they were thin shoots, but then resulted due to their erodible foundations and pretty severe scour downstream. Um, again, simple ways to estimate it. It's a relative thing, so there's some empirical data for us, and it's only the initiation, then we're back into erosion of rock and soil. 